Okay, thank you very much um, for the introduction. So what I want to do um, for the period of this talk then is, is to give you some examples where I've been out into museums and various places and to schools and share what I think is the wonder of sort of microbiology. Um, so it's really um, my advent, well, some of my adventures in sort of microbiology and art, and there's only a few of them here because I've done lots of them and, and there's, there's not enough time to talk about them. But if you are interested, here's my blog and I blog a lot of what I do um, on the blog. Um, my interest in, in microbiology came around uh, really when I was a teenager, when I was reading sort of gallons of science fiction, and the, the, one of the first books I read was H.G. Wells' War in the Worlds, and the very first sort of opening lines of that um, alludes to a man looking down a microscope like a scientist might scrutinize transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. And when I read that, that was really my first introduction into microbiology, these invisible things that have so much power. And it sounds sort of cliché, but I knew then that I really had to become a microbiologist. And standing on the sort of fourth floor of the, the hotel over the road um, last night, sort of looking down, um, I felt very much as if I was that microbiologist, looking down on this sort of almost invisible world, world with these sort of tiny creatures, tin-like creatures, um, zipping around. So I felt that I'd become that man in the white coat looking down um, a mi microscope. So that was really my sort of in inspiration for, for becoming a microbiologist. And uh, for the past 17, 18 years now, I've been a, a, a lecturer at the University of Surrey. And one of the modules that I most enjoy is a basic um, first year microbiology practical called Practical, Biomedic practical and Biomedical Bacteriology. Um, I've been there so long that the course has evolved over many years. It's been through one, two, three, four, five sort of iterations. And today, um, it's BMS 1035. And as part of that module, to, to engage sort of students and just to give them something fun to do while they're doing their sort of more serious sort of practicals, we give them um, brightly pigmented bacteria like Serratius mar marquesans here, uh, Micrococcus luteus and Chromobacterium violaceum here. And we get them to just do simple pictures, either of themselves or sort of common things. Um, there is some science here, um, those of you that are looking closely, you can see that the, the colonies of serratia, which is normally red in colour, are starting to segregate, so they're losing the ability to produce the pigment prodigiosin. So there is a little bit of science in that I sometimes explain to them when they comment on that. So they draw pictures of themselves, they draw sort of flowers, and their artistic um, ability outweighs mine uh, by many, many fold. Um, they do cats and elephants, and I think my favourite is this well-known. <laughs> Um, character here, Homer Simpson. Um, so I've been, had in the back of my mind for many, many years now that if somebody really had artistic ability and could actually paint, which I, I can't, then they could really make a, a fantastic picture um, out of bacteria. But we weren't the first people to start um, doing this. Um, Alexander Fleming, who's obviously noted for his discovery of Fleming, he was what we think is probably one of the first bioartists, so the first artist to use sort of living material in his art. And when he started to isolate bacteria, he would have noticed that some of them uh, gave rise to sort of brightly colored sort of pigments, so red, yellow, um, orange here. And he started to do um, pictures using his colored and pigmented bacteria um, and Based on his pictures, he was actually admitted as an artist to the Chelsea Arts Club, um, and his, it, that was on the suggestion of Whistler, uh, the painting. So that was back in 1891. So back in 1891, Alexander Fleming was using bacteria to make sort of paintings. So we had to do something um, new, I guess, and novel to, to build on um, this sort of first bacteria and art experiment. So. Um, out of the blue, really, an artist called Joe Wonder phoned me up and said, I, I'm interested in working back bacteria. Would you, would you want me in your lab? And I sort of thought two or three times about it and eventually mentioned to her that I had this fantastic idea that if you could really paint with bacteria, we've got all these different colours and you can make a really good picture. She thought, she thought it was fantastic. And with our artistic background, she decided that we should make a, a, a representation of John Mie's Ophelia completely out of coloured um, bacteria. Um, at the time, the palette I had was quite restricted. We only had sort of a few yellows, a pink, uh, an orange, and, and a red. Um, so we had to apply for Wellcome Trust funding. We were successful uh, back in, I think it was 2006, and we got Wellcome Trust funding for a project that was called 60 Days of Goodbye Poems um, of Ophelia. That was the sort of contribution of the artist, this um, uh, title. 
Um, and eventually it appeared on the BBC One show back in 2012. So the idea was to, was to gather a pigment of coloured bacteria and use those to make a, a, a painting of John Millet's um, Ophelia. So for the period of about six months, I sort of looked in the literature, um, begged people, uh, wrote off to culture collections, and I acquired um, what I think is a relatively unique uh, palette of brightly colored sort of bacteria. So we've got sort of purple, reds, your common yellows, um, green here, which I think is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and this lovely blue one here, which is Vogicella um, indigofera, which is an unusually blue pigmented sort of bacteria amongst other pigments as well. And that was the starting point for our sort of project to paint Ophelia out of um, colored bacteria. Um, so this is, a this is the original sort of painting um, by John Melier. So Ophelia um, sort of, I think she committed suicide or, or no, Ophelia reclining in sort of waters with sort of flowers um, around her. And then the first sort of early attempts were sort of um, a lot of sort of the green color here, but hopefully you can make out some uh, picture here. Um, another sort of quite early attempt, again, the flowers here and a sort of face. And then as the artist became more practiced, I hope you can see that, um, she became a lot more successful in sort of making this representation of Ophelia. So everything you see on here and on here is completely made out of the different pigmented sort of bacteria that we sort of generated. Um, so that was the final outcome. And we did a lot of sort of time lapse of the painting growing and, and of the sort of bacteria interacting with each other and competing with each other to, to produce the final um, versions of that. Um, so the next project that, that led on from that then um, was a project that sort of inverted the process. So the, rather than um, painting with the bacteria, in a sense, we asked the bacteria to paint for themselves. And it was a project um, with a, a watercolor artist called Sarah Roberts. And Sarah Roberts was interested in the way that our pigmented bacteria would interact with her watercolor pigment. So she came to the lab um, one day and we spent an afternoon um, in the laboratory and she painted these watercolor pigments. So the blue here, the white, the, the yellow and the green here and the other blue here, they are all traditional watercolors that she uses as part of her um, art. And she wanted to see what the bacteria would, wait, would make of these sort of pigments. So inside the center of each of those, I put a dob of Serratia uh, marquescens. The outcome of this um, featured in Nature News back in 2011. And the reason I find, find this so exciting is, is what the bacteria did to these sort of pigments. So this was before incubation. We put those in the incubator overnight. And when we um, turned up in the morning, and went into the incubator, this is what the bacteria had done. So they'd moved over the surface of the agar, swarming in a coordinated way, and they'd picked up the pigments, the blue here and the green here, and had sort of completely rearranged them according to their own sort of whim. Um, here's another picture. This is, again, the, all of the red here is serratia marquescens, and the green here is the watercolor pigment that it's picked up and moved around. Again here... Um, and then this is another bacterium, uh, Proteobacteria mirabilis, mixed with a blue uh, pigment, and you can see it, it's moved it around. Um, I must mention here that not all bacteria paint. Um, we've tried many different kinds, and some of them just don't do anything. They, they either stay put or they don't move the pigments, but certainly Serratia and Proteus are able to, to do this. And as a scientist, um, I find this sort of fascinating because to me, what we're seeing on a sort of a visual sort of macroscopic level are bacteria picking up pigments and moving them around the media. And that reflects our modern understanding of sort of bacteria and how they interact, the way that they move, they're motile, they swarm, they talk to each other, and they have sort of coordinated behavior and how they can arrange themselves into structures like sort of building channels within sort of biofilms. So to me, and I hope to the, the, the public that see these, it gives them some idea that the bacteria aren't simple things. They're very complex communicating life forms. Um, the other um, project that is, again, it's based on this kind of interaction between sort of pigmented bacteria and how they interact with each other. And it's based on a sort of, again, another boyhood obsession. I don't know how many of you in the audience are old enough to remember these games here. We've got sort of diplomacy at the top here and sort of risk at the bottom. And when I was a boy, before Nintendos had ever been thought of, before Seegers even, and certainly before things like the Xboxes, et cetera, et cetera, we used to spend hours playing sort of board games where we'd have sort of colored armies on one side of the world, 
somebody else would have a color, colored army on the other side of the world, would throw dice, and all these soldiers would fight, and somebody eventually uh, would win. Um, so with the idea that bacteria interact with each other, I wanted to sort of recreate that kind of process of a board game, but rather than using plastic soldiers, I wanted to use living bacterial um, soldiers. And it's based on this sort of lovely sentence by um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who said, the microscope discovers what motions, what tumult, what wars, what pursuits, and what sort of stratagem. So it's the idea that underneath the microscope, in a world that most of us don't generally think about, unless we're microbiologists, we have all of these sort of wars and um, battles sort of going on. And it was inspired by um, these games. This became part of a, a communi community microbes um, project that I had with um, Alexandra Chauvin Penn and Claudio Avigne uh, Rossa, who are both, um, one's a microbiologist in our section, and, and Alexander works in the sociology um, department. And it was a, a project to get bacteria out, in, out into the community to show people what they were and to move people away from the sort of common misrepresentation of bacteria as things that germ-like sort of cartoon animals that live in toilets and, and that must be destroyed at all cost. So we um, set up a, um, a sort of a series of tests for a sort of war game. So if you look at the, the top um, plate here, we've got um, a, a very poorly, crudely drawn map here with um, different sections on, but those different sections have been filled with different pigmented um, bacteria. And this is the, the list of them here. We've got Serratia marquesans, which is the red color, Chromobacterium volacium, which is the purple bacterium, um, the red pink is Arthrobacter agilis, Micrococcus luteus. The blue one is this one here is Voxella indigofera. And the orange colored one here is Dermococcus nicinomyensis, which is the orange um, color. So this is before um, we incubated them. So this is directly after inoculation. And then this is a test to see what would happen. You can see from the very first small test that some of the bacteria have sort of stayed put, but others like the Chromobacterium volacium and the Serratia have actually sort of moved around the plate um, in a way that maybe an aggressive army would. And if you can see the, the blue colored bacterium here, which is Voxella indigofera, um, hasn't moved, but it's probably produced a, a kind of antibiotic or some kind of antimicrobial substance that, that's at least prevented the red bacterium from invading um, its, its sort of territory. So this was a very early test um, for the project, and we scaled that up. Um, so we got um, another artist um, to make a giant petri dish. So this is a huge petri dish. It, it, we might, it might be the largest petri dish in the world, we're not sure, but it was about a meter um, in size. Um, and we got some of our students to come into the laboratory and inoculate that petri dish with the different colored bacteria that we've, we've been working with. So they, they did that. Um, this is the, the final sort of inoculation where you can see each of the colored patches here represents a different type of pigmented bacteria. And then we incubated that overnight. And in the following morning, um, the bacteria had, had moved around the plate. Um, and then eventually, after about two or three days, they'd reached like a steady state where there was no more action sort of happening. And this was sort of the, the game over, really. So you can see here that the red colored bacterium has sort of grown mostly and, and overrun all of the other sort of bacteria. But the, the, the intriguing thing from a public engagement um, aspect here is, is the way it shows people the way that sort of bacteria can interact, much like sort of humans interact. We can be aggressive like the red colored bacterium, or we can ad adopt sort of defensive strategies and produce antibiotics as is in the case of the blue bacterium um, here. So this was the Petri dish in its final setting. So this was a, a tailor-made table um, with the petri dish containing the living bacteria underneath it. You'll note here from a safety perspective, it's been labeled with biohazard and sealed so that young hands don't get, gain access to it. That's one of my fears um, with this kind of work that somebody manages to contaminate themselves. But we do risk assessments and take this very seriously. And then the public can engage and, co and interact with the bacteria by playing a sort of war game on the surface of that um, table. You can see underneath there that just from a safety perspective, there's a spill kit with a disinfectant and some tissues there, <laughs> just to highlight that. Okay, so the other um, aspect of, of my work that sort of stayed with me for, for most of my sort of career in microbiology is sort of bacterial um, bioluminescence. And many, many years ago, um, in the mid 1980s, I think it was, um, I did a PhD project with the late Professor Gordon Stewart at the University of Nottingham. And my PhD project was to isolate, um, so I did used to do science, and I still do some science um, today, 
Um, but it was to isolate a, um, a promoter from E. coli that was sensitive to salt. And it was, we eventually found out it was a promoter called the pro U promoter. So the pro U promoter sensed the, the presence of salt in the environment. When salt was present, it turned gene expression on of the corresponding pro U gene. And when salt was absent, it turned off the corresponding pro U gene. So one of my very first um, experiments after I discovered the pro-U promoter was to take the promoter and put it in front of the LUX-AB gene. So the LUX-AB genes were taken from the bacterium Photobacterium phosphorium. They produce an enzyme called bacterial luciferase, so when they're expressed they produce a blue-green light. And the idea here was that if I put the pro-U promoter in front of the LUX-AB genes, then we'd have a very convenient um, measure for the uh, turning on and off of those sort of particular genes. So when the genes were turned on, um, so this is a, um, a, a, an image taken with a photon counting camera with the E. coli containing this pro-U LUX-AB. That should be LUX-A. God, even then, even then I was making mistakes. Look, that should be LUX-AB. So LUX-A, LUX-B. I don't, I don't think the examiner picked up that up in my thesis. <laughs> Um, so, so this is a, a photograph taken of a photon counting camera. Um, here, the, uh, a filter paper take, t containing the E. coli has been transferred from a, a normal LB plate onto an LB plate containing 0.3 molar sodium chloride. And then images have been taken every sort of few seconds. You can see almost immediately that the gene expression starts to sort of turn on. So this sort of really hooked me on, on sort of bacterial um, bioluminescence. And it was at a time when photon coating cameras were only really coming into being. And most of the time, I would spend hours in a darkened room waiting for my eyes to adapt so that I could actually visually see the colonies. And when I saw a, a colony that was glowing in the dark that was the E. coli, it always got a, a huge sort of thrill of excitement because it meant my cloning had been successful. Um, by the way, this plasmid took... Um, probably about sort of six months to a year to build. It would probably take a week today. We eventually sequenced the Pro-U promoter. It was only about 500 base pairs. And again, that took about sort of oh, almost sort of six months to a year to, to sequence using the old Sanger sequencing sort of technology. So again, today, that you probably do that in a few seconds. Um, this was a way of represent representing it sort of technically. So here um, is the E. coli in um, media with no salt. And here is the E. coli with media to which 0.3 molar sodium chloride has sort of been added. So even then, I was, this is like a formal scientific representation. This is a, an artistic sort of rep representation of it, I think, um, even back then. So I've, I've sort of started off using sort of bioluminescence as, as part of my science and moved away from it for quite a few years. And then more recently, I've sort of become involved in sort of bioluminescence, not as, so much as a scientist this time, but as somebody that wants to engage the public with microbiology. And I think one of the most beautiful phenomena in bacteriology and microbiology is the production of light by um, microorganisms. Um, so this was a project with an artist called Anne um, Brody, and in 2009 to 2011, we got funding again from the Wellcome Trust to explore bioluminescence beyond the confines of a laboratory, so to engage the public with this beautiful um, light. And the projects that we had um, based on this were, were shown at the Royal Institution, the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum, and the Secret Garden Party, which was a music festival um, in Northamptonshire. Um, so the basis of this project is um, bioluminescent bacteria, and the bioluminescent bacteria we use is a strain of Photobacterium phosphorium, which we call HB, because it seems, for some whatever reasons we're not entirely sure of, to, to be very, very bright. When you compare this to other Photobacterium phosphorium species and, and to things like Vibrio fischeri or Vibrio harvii that are commonly used to produce bioluminescence, it's by far, it's, it's much, much brighter than these sort of common um, strains. So these bacteria look quite innocuous um, in daylight, but when you turn the light off, they emit a lovely sort of blue-green sort of bioluminescence. And they do this when they live in symbiosis with the marine organisms. Without going into huge amounts of detail, um, some deep sea organisms that produce light only produce light because they have a symbiotic relationship with bacteria like Photobacterium phosphorium and Vibrio harvii. <clears throat> and to produce light, the bacteria must communicate with each other so that lonely cells on their own don't produce light because it's too metabolically expensive for them to do that. So working with um, Anne Brody, um, oh, this is an early experiment with, a, with our students. Again, BMS 1035, our practical uh, bacteriology 
module. Again, as, as a sort of an engaging diversion away from the science. So we cover Vibrios in one of our um, experiments. We, we don't grow Vibrio cholerae, but we look at the importance of Vibrios in causing disease. But one of the other aspects of Vibrios is obviously that some of them produce light. And we get them to paint pictures um, of their favorite things, uh, obviously faces. Sometimes we get love letters, we get sort of pets. Um, we some, occasionally get very rude um, designs that I've <laughs> deliberately removed. But the students go into the dark room and, and they really love sort of seeing their, their, their paintings sort of lighting up um, a dark room. Um, so to, for the project I had with Anne Brody, um, the idea then was to make this bioluminescent um, photo booth that's already been um, mentioned. So the idea was to have a, a, a sort of a tent-like structure that was completely black inside it. Um, and the only source of light would be bioluminescent sort of bacteria. And so this is a, a box of the bacteria that I actually had to prepare. So there's a few hundred plates um, in here that look quite boring until you turn the lights off. And when you turn the lights off, they produce this ethereal uh, blue-green blue, blue glow. Um, when we ran this, site, this project at the Science Museum, um, after the project had finished, I had to put all the bacteria back into the box to be transported back to the labs in a car to be destroyed um, in our autoclaves, and I was waiting outside the Science Museum on a dark night with this box partially opened, <laughs> and it was glowing um, in the dark quite visibly, and just at the same time a policeman happened to be walking by, and I was like, it was whizzing through my mind going, oh my God, how am I going to explain this? But he, he just ignored it and walked on, so that was, a, that was quite a, a good piece of luck. But so the idea was to, to scale this up and to make huge amounts of sort of light, and we did that. Um, so these are sort of flasks on the side of the, the, the tent, and plates here, there was a, about 500 plates in total. And the first, um, the first outing, really, for the Bioluminous Photo Booth was at the Royal Institution, the Crossing Over event, that was an event that was supposed to mix art and sort of science together. And that happened back in 2009. And as I said previously, it was with the, the artist Anne Brody. Um, so we got various people um, in that booth, and we were lucky to have some quite eminent scientists. Anybody re re recognize this chap? Yeah, so this is Marcus de Soto. So he came and sat in the box, and the exposure time, because the light is relatively dim and the camera wasn't particularly sensitive. The exposure time here is about two um, minutes. So that's Marcus de Sortoy. And anybody recognize this chap? He's from, he's from the, the other discipline, from the other side, the dark side. So this is Sir Christopher Frailing, who was at the time the, the um, chairman of the Arts um, Council. So these were um, quite interesting sort of portraits. But they, to me, they became even more exciting when I put my two boys um, into the photo booth and got them to, put, to put, have their photos. Taken. So this was Joe a few years ago now, so he's age seven at the time. And you can see that the, the two sci the scientists and the artists are, are used to having the photos taken. They're used to having portraits and to posing and to, and to sitting still. Um, Joe sort of managed to do that to some extent, but Josh, um, who's slightly hyperactive, <laughs> he was six and he just cannot sit still. And I love the way that this sort of ghostly pattern reflects the him as an individual who sort of can't, and even today can't sit still and sort of fidgets um, a lot. Um, so building on um, from sort of not using children in, in experiments or anything, but um, <laughs> trying to engage children with microbiology, this is, um, um, these are footprints here and a handprint from two sort of celebrities. And this was a project, um, I, I, does anybody want to hazard a guess who that might be? <laughs> two children's presenters. If somebody shouts bogeys at the back of the, the... Those that are young enough to know. So this was um, two TV presenters called Dick and Dom, and they had a, 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 a series called Absolute Genius, and the idea of Absolute Genius was to use their sort of comedy um, and to use that comedy to engage children with sort of science. And, and they covered lots of different aspects, but the, as, the aspect I was involved in was sort of looking at microbiology and Alexander Fle Fleming's discovery of sort of penicillin. Um, so these are their footprints and handprints, and we sort of grew bacteria in, in bacteria, so we got them to do handprints on agar, grew the bacteria up. We got them to spit on agar, play, onto agar, onto slides, and look at the bacteria down the microscope. Obviously, this one here is the, is the sort of rather childish one, mist and spat all over the lab floor. And um, we spent, crikey, a whole day filming from about 8 in the morning to 8 o'clock at night. Um, and for about, I don't know, probably about less than 10 minutes of television, and most of what actually went on couldn't be filmed, couldn't be um, put out because it was too rude for the children. <laughs> but it was a, it was a hugely fun um, experience. 
Um, so <clears throat> one of the other, um, moving away from bacteria now, one of the other life forms, uh, microbiological life forms that, I, that I've always sort of been fascinated with, and again, it's something that's an, a really engaging organism for anybody that wants to engage young children or school children in microbiology, is the slime mold. Um, so the slime mold, um, this one in particular, is, is a type of microorganism. This um, rather engaging one here is called Physarium polycephalum, polycephalum meaning many-headed, and it's reasonably common in sort of damp woodlands um, growing on leaves, and it feeds on sort of bacteria and other uh, life forms on, on sort of decaying vegetation. And if you look carefully in damp woodlands in sort of autumn time, you can quite often see this and other slime molds sort of growing on branches and underneath um, leaves. This um, slime mold, the, the, it's a plasmodial slime mold. Um, there are probably people that know slime molds in a lot more detail than I do, but these are one huge single cell. So all of this structure here, all of the structure there is one massive cell with thousands of nuclei all circling around, so circling around at the same time. So they are quite visually appealing um, organisms. What makes them especially attractive for, for, for children, I think, is that they're very safe, please trust me, but they move um, over surfaces. So they will move towards things that they like and they will move to, away from things that they don't like. They do it quite slowly at about a millimeter an hour, but, and you can't really see that, but if you go around and do something else for about 10 minutes and come back, you can obviously see that this thing has moved over the agar surface. So they moved about a millimeter um, an hour. And because of that, they do um, present special issues with, with regards to biological containment for rather careless scientists and microbiologists such as myself, because if you leave the lid off, they will escape, unlike bacteria, and uh, start to explore their bacteria. And if you put things in the way, they will move over those things and explore them um, as well. Um, so we've been involved in a number of sort of projects with these um, life forms where we, where we take them out and we get children to do various um, things with them. And almost inevitably, when we have them in um, a workshop environment, the children always want to take them home as pets, so that they make great first pets for or microbial pets uh, for children. Um, there's a lot of interesting science. Again, I'm, I'm no slime mold expert, but they are fascinating organisms, and they, they have a remarkable ability to, to, to calculate roots. So if you take a slime mold and you make a map of, I think this was Tokyo, and the, the area surrounding Tokyo, uh, with places of human population, so instead of having cities there or dots, you make those places of population, you inoculate those with slime mold food, so which is essentially porridge. So if you do take them home, they're very easy to grow at home. You can just feed them porridge ad infinitum. Um, but if you replace the cities with slime mold foods, you introduce a slime mold into, that, into the central area and leave it um, for a few hours, so a few days, the slime mold will eventually link all of those points of food together. And, it does so in the sort of shortest possible route. And if you superimpose that slime mold design sort of road system onto the true Tokyo transport system, it's remarkably similar. So something as simple as a slime mold has the ability to not to perform conscious calculations, but to solve quite complex mathematical equations. And there are a group of scientists that are using slime molds to, to model um, infrastructures and also to build computers um, out of them. Um, so that's way beyond the children that we use um, to engage um, slime molds with. Um, so I've been involved in a number of sort of different workshops where we take um, slime molds out. We've done this with the Wellcome Trust. Um, we've done it at various sort of scientist, science festivals. And we basically ask the children to, to paint, sometimes with coloured porridge oats, um, sometimes with just dots of porridge. And we get the children to paint, we add a slime mold to the surface, and then the children take the slime molds home with instructions how to care for them and if they become mouldy to dispose of them. And they post their pictures back to us and they, they love to see the slime molds sort of moving over their sort of pictures. Um, this was just some um, messing about that we did at one workshop where we had some denim, we inoculated the slime mold onto, onto some denim, so these were denim jeans, and the slime mold forms these lovely sort of reactive patterns on, on the textiles. Okay, so going back um, to the, the practical I run, so practical bi biomedical and bacteriology, um, and again, this was an idea that I picked up many years ago now from Joe Verano, who I think was the first person to do this. So this is a way of visualizing 
um, the presence of bacteria on things that we commonly encounter. And Joe's early sort of experiment was to do this with sort of mobile phones. And I think when Joe did it many, many years ago, the phones used to have keys on them so that when you imprinted the mobile phone onto the agar, you could actually see the shape of the keys where people had um, touched them. But today, because everybody tends to have smartphones, you don't tend to see the keys, but you can see that there's obviously a home button here that's used a lot that you get bacteria. So the idea here is to, is to take a mobile phone in, in the bacteriology practical. It's the only time we allow the students to bring their phones in and to use them. They print them onto agars, they take them off, we incubate them over the period of the week, and then they come in the following week and they see all this um, growth on the mobile phones. They're initially disgusted, but when we explain that this is the part of the world that we live in and it's inevitable, they, they seem to calm um, down a bit. So um, we, each sort of student brings in the mobile phone. So we have anywhere from sort of from 100 to 180 students on the module. Um, so we have lots of pictures of sort of mobile phones. And I um, blogged these uh, back in 2013 when we first did the experiments. And then more recently in 2014 when we did the experiments. Um, Shortly after I blogged them, there was like a viral outbreak um, that went on. And then nothing happened until January 2015. And for reasons I don't really know, the story took hold again in, in, in sort of this year. And it resulted in 300 sort of news items written on this, the, the presence of bacteria on mobile phones. It appeared everywhere. And these are the places in the world that we sort of hit. So most of the world was sort of contaminated with our story of sort of mobile um, and phones, and this is, <laughs> this is far more hits than any of my scientific publications have ever had, so I'm quite proud of, <laughs> quite proud of this one. <clears throat> um, and then this year's experiment that is sort of grumbling away um, in, the, in, the, in the back growth, it's, it's been um, featured by a few newspapers, but not many at the moment, so it's exactly the same kind of experiment with exactly the same module, but with this year's crop of um, um, undergraduate students. It, it's the same experiment, but looking at... Um, growth on money, so hence the, the pun here, financial growth. Um, and these are basically, um, I think, probably £10 note, £20 note, and sort of £5 note. And again, th these things are actually covered um, in, money, in bacteria. The students sort of look at them, they go, ah, and then we say it's, it's not a problem, we're covered in bacteria um, too. This is, a, this is a lovely one. This is, an, 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 again, another fascinating bacterium. It's called Bacillus mycoides. And it's the only bacterium that, that produces this complex sort of pattern and will grow over an agar surface. But we very commonly find this in oil. So we know wherever we find this, the chances are either the mobile phone or the money has been in contact with, with soil. It's either been dropped in soil or, or accumulated it um, as a, through a secondary uh, mechanism. Okay, one of the other projects that... Um, I often run with small groups of sometimes children if I visit sort of schools and sometimes adults is, is this idea of sort of microgeography. So it, it comes from being a microbiologist, walking around urban environments um, and noticing that there, there are microorganisms around us that most people don't ever bother to look at. But then when you look at them closely and you become hooked on doing this, you tend to notice lots of, of really interesting sort of phenomenon and the, it's the kind of phenomenon that happens in the laboratory but the mimicked out in the ur urban environment so I call it micro geography and it's a way of engaging people um, with microbes by observing them in situ in the environments like sort of cities so I was walking around Birmingham town center earlier today and, and all of the, the churches are festooned in, in algal growth so it's an example of this kind of phenomenon but if you look carefully um, you see lots of interesting things. So this was, um, um, this was over in Norway, I think. Um, this was a dark alley. And you can see that there's, there's an algal um, ecology here um, that's bright green. But for some reason, the algae has not been able to grow here. So whether that's deprivation of light or whether it's deprivation of, of water, we don't really know. But it, it, you can use this as an example of sort of showing the requirements for growth. So you need light and water if you're an algae. If you, if you don't get that, the algae won't be able to grow. So you're taking a laboratory situation and transposing it into the greater environment. This is a coastal town um, in England, in Kent. Um, the roof is festooned in lichens because you get lots of seagulls sitting on the roof. Seagull feces contains lots of nitrogen, um, allows the lichens to grow. But what's quite interesting here is that underneath the windows, um, there isn't much sort of growth. Now, whether that's uh, excess water flow 
um, you don't get much water flow, or whether it's the lead in the lead flashing that's poisoning the lichens, we don't really know. But again, it's, it's an example of a phenomenon that you might see in a laboratory, so in Richmond and um, inhibition, that you could see on a rooftop in a village uh, in Kent. And then finally, this is a, a picture of a building. So this grey material here isn't sort of pollution. It's actually um, a, sort of a kind of cryptobiotic crust. So if you look at it under a microscope, there are sort of um, cyanobacteria, fungi, and lots of different kinds of microorganisms that, that grow very, very slowly and form a crust on, on sort of the roofs of lots of the buildings that we look at. And this here is basically a, a zone of inhibition, much like you'd see if you were testing an antibiotic in a, in a laboratory. And the inhibition, we think, is caused by heat coming out of these sort of fans. So the heat that's coming out of these is killing whatever organisms are growing there and producing a zone of inhibition much like an antibiotic would do on a piece of agar in a laboratory. So the, the idea behind all of these is that you can take people out into an urban environment without them ever becoming close to a laboratory, and you can teach them the same kind of things that would happen um, in a laboratory. So there's, for anybody that's interested, there's a website for that um, here. Okay, then, to finish off, really, these are some um, up-and-coming projects that, that, that I'm involved in um, in the future. And again, it's, it's all to do with the idea of um, enthusing and engaging people with, with microbiology and, and bacteria and other, other life forms. So this is um, um, some art that I will have at um, um, a project at the Edom, uh, sorry, the Eden Project here, um, down in Cornwall on the 22nd of May. I think that's the opening ceremony, so it won't be available till the following week. But they have a project that's funded by the Wellcome Trust called Invisible You that's to look at the human um, microbiome. Um, and there are a number of artists involved um, in the project. And one of my contributions to this is, um, a, and again, it sort of stems from the early sort of paintings that I showed you with bacteria. So I thought um, every, for every artist that's ever existed, be it a Van Gogh or a, a Mie, um, they will have had their own microbiome, and their own microbiome in terms of cell numbers would have dwarfed their own human sort of cells. So I thought that that microbiome would have been involved to some extent in their sort of painting processes. <clears throat> so what I did, I isolated my own microbiome, mixed it with watercolors, and asked it to paint. So these are um, portraits, self-portraits from me, but they are made by my own microbiome. So the bacteria, this huge part of me that normally goes... Um, and talked about uh, moving the watercolours and painting and sort of moving them around the picture. So I've got a series of these on um, down at the Eden Centre um, from May time. Um, and then um, there's another project coming up at the Wellcome Collection in London, and the, this is apparently the Year of Light. And um, as part of that, the, the Wellcome Trust have got a, a, um, a workshop, a, no, a series of events called On Light, and it's, it's looking at light from a medical um, aspect. And with an artist that I've worked a lot with called Anna Dimitriou, we're um, establishing a bacterial light laboratory. So we'll have lots of examples of glowing, sort of glow-in-the-dark um, bacteria. And this is, this is a lovely quote by Edmund Burke here and a, a picture of Joe, my son, looking at a bowl that contains bioluminescent bacteria, sort of glowing nicely. And, and the quote here is, the important thing is not to stop questioning curiosity. Is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence, Existing, one cannot help but be in awe when he, sorry, that, that, that's not me, that's Edward Burke, contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, and of the marvelous structure um, of reality. And that's one of the things I think that's always driven me as a scientist, a sort of a natural curiosity. And I think it's things, it's a, it's a, a trait that both scientists and artists have, I think, I think as well. So finally, just a, a few thank yous. So um, I'd like to thank the late Gordon Stewart, who I was his um, PhD student, so he gave me the opportunity to start on this career. Um, the Wellcome Trust for funding me um, quite extensively um, in my sort of engagement activities. For, for Professor David Blackburn, who's here, who nominated me, and to the SGM for um, awarding me this prize and to my family um, for the many lost weekends, and also for being the occasional sort of guinea pigs for some of my experiments and for stumbling across things grown in cupboards at home um, and not being shocked, and also for the many artists that I've, I've worked with. And then finally, um, you'd think that the, the, the things that I work with and I work so hard to promote would be actually be grateful, but I'm afraid they're not. And um, back in September 2011, I was unlucky enough to come down with bacterial endocarditis, so I had Streptococcus mitis growing on my um, heart valves, and I spent uh, over a month in hospital. 
um, being administered intravenously about six grams of penicillin um, every four hours, so much so that I, I mean, if any of you have ever worked in the lab, either with penicillin or ampicillin, there's a very powerful aroma associated with that. I just stunk of it completely, and the whole ward stunk of it because of the, the amount that was being put into me. Thankfully, I'm okay now, and the, the, the infection is gone, but I'd also like to thank Dr. Matthew Dryden at the Hampshire Hospitals for, for diagnosing and for treating me, and also for um, um, acquiescing to one of my requests. So, because I knew I had this bacterium in my bloodstream, I got him to take a picture of them for me, <laughs> as you do. And um, so these are my red blood cells here, and these chains here are, are Streptococcus mitis um, in my bloodstream. So it's quite a poignant sort of picture, um, but I like to sort of use that as a, as a, I'm a living example of medical microbiology to my students. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to finish there, um, please. I'm, I'm told there aren't any questions, but if any of you want to come up to me afterwards or contact me with, via email, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to do that. Thank you very much.